this is Heather Rhoda. <laughs> I, work, <laughs> I work for the Cloudburst Group. I'm a senior analyst at the Cloudburst Group. I'm not gonna go through the whole full bio that everybody else has done. You can see it on the app. Um, and some folks um, may know me from some other presentations that I've done, as well as if I've ever taken a look at any of your capers or APRs, that would have been me, right? And now my great and awesome colleague, Morgan, um, Stevenson, who you may know too, she is taking um, a larger role in doing that, um, but we're still on, the, still on the same team. I've been at Cloudburst for about four years, and I have a, a pretty good background in some other programs. I've been doing um, you know, housing in the field before I worked for Cloudburst, so I was a Hopwell grantee. I worked with um, Shelter Plus Care back when it was called Shelter Plus Care. Now it's rental assistance. And I've done also some Section 8 work. So I've worked um, you know, in the community at various you know, different capacities. So I think that's sometimes helpful in understanding you know, the questions that we get and um, trying to figure out you know, creative ways or <laughs> how, to, how to help you interpret the rules because they're not always very clear, right? So here, we're gonna be talking about income and rent calculation in 25 minutes. You could do really a whole day on this, couldn't you? And so this is really gonna be providing you with just a high level overview of some reminders and uh, some things you need to know um, in order to determine household income and calculate tenant portion of rent. I just wanted to remind you of the Hopwit Institute's theme in housing's role in ending the HIV epidemic. How, how do you think, and this is maybe a stretch, but how do you think completing correct income calculation and rent calculations can help in ending the HIV epidemic? It's just part of overall quality, quality of your program, right? And running a good program and following the rules and the policies and ensuring that the clients that you're assisting, you're calculating their income correctly, right? They're not paying any more, any less. So it's peripherally involved, but it's still part of your overall component because it's still a component of um, administering, you know, rental assistance or facility-based assistance. And these are a few things that we're gonna talk about today. It basically shows you how the presentation is organized. First, we're gonna talk about household composition and characteristics, right? So what's, what's your composition, right? That's how, how many people are gonna be living in the household? How many? One, two, three. Do you expect anybody to leave? Do you expect anybody um, to join the household. Those are kinds of things you're gonna wanna know. In addition, you're gonna wanna know who, right? The characteristics, who's living there with you. Um, and it's not be, you know, because you're being nosy, right? You need to know if you're gonna have any adults, any adult full-time students, um, any, look, any minors, so I get to use my pointer. Foster children, foster adults, a live-in aid, or temporary absent family member. This isn't everything, but I just wanted to give you an example, just that you know when you're doing your household composition, that you really wanna know who and the age of the folks that are gonna be living there. And before I get to the next slide, why? Why do you think you need to know some of this stuff? The how many and the characteristics. Say that again, you said because not everybody's income is gonna be counted? Okay, yep. Right, yep, because you're gonna to wanna to know for bedroom sizes. Right, right, for identifying exclusions, inclusions, for identifying allowances, right? Good, you guys, I didn't even need to do this. Um, um, income type and frequency. 
And this, just remember, this isn't all of it. I just wanted to give you an idea. So these are some of the kind of like income types. So you're gonna have like your earned income. So you have your part-time, your full-time, and the lovely ones that is always are def hard to figure out sometimes, right? Seasonal and sporadic. Don't some of those don't drive you crazy sometimes trying to figure out the difference between seasonal and sporadic? Okay. So when we finish up, I can circle back around if you remind me, because I have some examples of seasonal and sporadic. Okay? And then you have your benefit income. Okay? So some of them, SSI, SSDI, veterans, SSA pension, retirement, et cetera. And then you have your other, your kind of regular reoccurring contributions, usually from someone outside the household to someone inside the household, and then your asset income. And now we're gonna show you um, frequency. And this is typically how you're kind of calculating income. Generally, hourly income, assuming full-time, right? These are full-time numbers, is calculated at um, uh, 2,080 hours, weekly means 52 weeks, bi-weekly means 26 weeks, semi-monthly means 24 weeks, and monthly means 12. I've often seen, um, back in my days of uh, low-income housing tax credit audits, these two, whoops, see, I can't do my pointer. These two get interchanged the bi-weekly and the semi-monthly. So other than um, full-time income, multiply the wages by the actual number of hours or weeks the person's expected to work. So it's usually like when you're dealing with somebody who has part-time income, right? Okay. And this is a list of some of the income inclusions. And some of these I'm, I'm sure you've seen before. Has anybody like never ever seen these? Okay, that's good. Let me see if some are usually sometimes trouble spots. I think actually this one right here, uh, reoccurring um, gifts is sometimes a trouble spot for folks. Or um, income from a temporary absent family member. And these are some of the exclusions. Has anybody never seen these? Okay, that's good too. What about the, um, one of the exclusions is the full amount of student financial assistance paid directly to the student or to the educational institution. That's an exclusion. Do you guys know that? Okay. Well, see, this is like, <laughs> and now we're going to go into some income allowances and deductions. This is a great chart, and you could actually, you know, download this into a PDF and, and keep it. And so these are some of the probably common um, income allowance and deductions that you're going to be using. So the elderly disabled, right, $400 per household, not per person, okay? Even if there are other household members that are disabled, it's just that qualifying the HOPWA eligible individual. Even if you have two people in the household that are HIV, the qualifying eligible individual or the head of household, whoever you designate, you're only getting that 400. Yeah. Say that again? Is that monthly or annually? Annually. annually. Yeah, it's just an annual, yeah. For dependents, 480 per dependent. And it's not monthly. This is something you give like at like an initial intake, initial lease up, and then when you recertify, you would reapply, you would reapply those deductions. So a dependent, full-time student, elderly disabled household member at any age, and minors under the age of 18, 
but not the head, spouse, or co-head. Unreimbursed medical expenses. I think this trips people up sometimes. On the Hopwa AAQ, I also sit on the Hopwa AAQ, we get quite a few questions about this. So unreimbursed medical expenses. You're gonna have a total amount of medical expenses but the amount you'll be able to use as the actual allowance is the amount that exceeds 3% of annual income. And we actually have an example of that that I'm gonna show you. So all members of the household residing in the elderly disabled household are eligible for this. So if you have you know, you're, the client is, you know, HIV positive, the head of the household, they get this $400 elderly, elderly disabled allowance, you can collect and get information for those unreimbursed medical expenses for everyone living in the household, not just the Hopwell eligible client. Is that clear? Is that new news or no? Sorry, it's dry in here. And then we have unreimbursed attendant care auxiliary apparatus expenses. This is similar to the unreimbursed medical. I don't see that very often. In a lot of the other programs I worked in the past, I didn't see that very often either. But it's the same thing. Um, all the household members uh, residing in the disabled household would be eligible for that. And then you have reasonable unreimbursed childcare. Um, it ends up, all of the amount ends up being a deduction, but the childcare expenses for children under the age of 13 to enable a family member to be employed or they're going to school, right? So if the child's 13, 14, 10, <laughs> Okay, so the question is at intake, when you're, when you're like, you, you know, do you, doing your rent calculation, um, and someone says, I have unreimbursed medical expenses, right? They should be bringing you invoices or, you know, information about their unreimbursed medical expenses that you can use to anticipate going forward. Sorry. <laughs> so question, under what circumstances would a Hopwa household not receive the $400 deduction? Right. Only when a minor with HIV is the qualifying person in the household. Now we're gonna do some examples. Whose income do you include? It's like a game show, right? We should have played like Jeopardy. That would have been fun. So whose income is included, okay? So I put them into two categories. We have earned income um, and other income, like income from assets. And it's a, this is a very simplified version, okay? Note that this is high level simplified version. So you have the head, spouse, co-head, so you're gonna include that earned income. You have an adult, an other adult, including a foster adult. So yes, yes. Children under 18, no. Other income, yes, you're gonna include it, right? So you're gonna include like um, survivor benefits, right? Or, or SSI payments that uh, the household receives on behalf of the child, right? It has the child's name. Um, and also asset income, if applicable. It's probably rare that you would see that, but you would also include that too. Um, Full-time student, 18 and older, not the head, co-head, or spouse. You're gonna exclude earned income that, ex 
exceeds 480, right? But all the other income you're going to include. So if they get SSI, you're going to include that, right? And you're going to include um, if they get child support, things like that. Foster child under 18, uh, no to earned income, and yes to other. And these are just a few more examples. So if you have a live-in aid, that's pretty common sense, no, no. If you're in shared housing, right, your client has a roommate, you're obviously not gonna include the roommate's income, right? If you're in shared housing with another household member, like you've had a reasonable accommodation and you know, you're living with a relative and it's shared housing, you're not a household, you're not gonna include their income or other income either. We're gonna to get to that. <laughs> okay, so based on this fancy flow chart, what would you do? So we have an adult, right? They're not the head, spouse or co-head. They're a full-time student. They receive social security, disability. They're working part-time. Do you include any of this household member's income? What do you include? Does somebody want to get up and give it a shot at the mic? Or I can walk around, because now I can walk around. Right? Because I can't hear you guys are all talking at once. Hello, oh, that hurts. Anybody? Thank you. I'm guessing 480 out of the part-time job and the social security disability 450 monthly. Ta-da! Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll hold the mic. Okay, thank you. Phil, and we have, we have, one, <laughs> we have one more, one more of these. So let's do one more because it's, these are fun, right? So we have a minor who's 17, full-time employment, 12,000 annually, receives a survivor benefit of 250 a month. Include any of this household member's income? What? Did someone say survivor benefit? Yes. Only the survivor benefit. Very good. These were way too easy. Way too easy. Now I know. <laughs> so now we're going to do a little bit of math. Well, kind of math. Some math. And we're going to calculate some rent. So this is the scene, OK? So we're making some assumptions, OK? in this example. So we have one qualifying HOFWA individual who's the head of household and a full-time student, okay? They have employment at 175 a week and they receive 150 per month from an aunt who's outside the household. They have health insurance, but they pay pres uh, prescription and appointment co-pays out of pocket uh, 1500 annually and they don't have they don't pay a premium in their paycheck okay because I know what you guys are gonna say <laughs> they don't pay a premium in their paycheck this person is very lucky that their employer pays their full premium okay so what income should you include and how do you calculate the income that's included so which income are you going to include So both income sources are included, both income sources. So the employment income, you're going to do, he's paid weekly, right? 175 times 52 equals 9,100 annually. And the reoccurring gifts from the aunt outside the household, so 1,800. Does that not count as part of contributions to the gift? 
Not if it's, if it's, if it, if you get like a, you know, a birthday card from your aunt, she sends you 50 bucks. That's, that's not, those things aren't included. But if you get a reoccurring, ongoing monthly amount from someone outside the household, that is counted. Yep. Gross annual income is, uh, am I in the way? Sorry. Are you guys laughing at me? No, because it's Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> if you ask, <laughs> right? But, but that's part of your intake, right? That's part of doing um, your intake form and asking those questions. And so if you ask and they say no, you've done your due diligence, right? And then if you find it later, then you need to address it, either through repay, uh, repayment, recalculation. Yeah, but I know oh, I, know, I hear you. <laughs> It'd be great if EIV, do you guys want to know what EIV is? Okay, but Hopwood doesn't use EIV, but you wouldn't see a gift from an aunt anyway, but, right, yeah, they couldn't be, yeah, you couldn't hide employment information, and EIV is Enterprise Information Verification, so housing authorities use it really often, yeah, yeah. Uh, Heather, yep. Heather, go ahead. I wanted to ask you a question because uh, aren't they required to have documentation? So all, of, this, all this has to be documented. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is assuming that all of that's occurring. It's just going through the, the technical aspects of completing a rent calc. And then also, I wanted to ask you, I, I know that other HUD programs like the Home TVRA has um, different ways of doing calculus. So you, have, you, you, you count the AGI, for example, the adjusted gross income versus the gross income. That's not in Hopper, right? Yeah, well, yes, we, we have a calculation that I'm going to go through actually at the end of this. Yeah. It's adjusted gross. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we covered that. Okay. So, any other sources of income? No. So, right, you're asking no other sources of income. So, are, will there be any possible allowances, income deductions or allowances for this person? Well, yes, because they're, you know, the Hopwell qualifying individuals, so they're going to get that 400, right? And they have some unreimbursed medical expenses, but you'll have to figure out what the allowance will be for the 1500, because it won't be the full 1500. Okay. Now we're going to go into the apartment. So like Jose, Jose said, right, you got to verify everything. So you're verifying the employment, right? You're verifying the unreimbursed medical. You're, you know, he totally tells you that his aunt helps him out. So you can get, um, you know, maybe, maybe they have like a bank account where she automatically deposits it in the bank account. But you can also do something, you know, in writing that she verifies that she pays this. And she's been doing it for, you know, 10 years and, you know. So Jose's right, you're gonna have verification for all of this. So, so assuming, we're gonna assume everything just to get through this, okay? So unit meets FMR, rent, reasonable, rent reasonableness, passes habitability. Um, the contract rent um, and utility allowance for uh, tenant paid utilities is as follows. So the contract rent and also the rent being charged from the landlord happens to be the same, 953. Utility allowance is 75, that's what the client has to pay. Um, and remember, if, if utility allowance isn't included, the total rent up here would have to equal the FMR. But in this case, what I did was I took the FMR for Maine, because I live in Maine, in Portland, Maine, in Portland, and I backed out the 75 to make sure that the two, when they equaled each other, met the FMR. I can go over that afterward if you want to see an example. It makes sense to me <laughs> in my head, <laughs> right? I'm like, okay. <laughs> but it's so hard, you've got 25 minutes, right? <laughs> I'm like, um, okay, so we have the gross annual income. We know that, right? It was uh, 10,900. Here's the, I'm going to go over here because I think I'm in their way. So here's the $400 deduction, disability. Here's the medical, unreimbursed medical expenses. So 
to figure out how much of this will be an allowance, you need to figure out 3% of like gross annual income. So it's 3% of this. So that's 327. Take your 1500 minus 327. Here is the amount that you can use for the unreimbursed medical expenses. Your total allowances, 400 plus 1173 equals 1573. This is what's going to adjust the income. And this is your new annual adjusted income. Some of this, I just put it here because you often see it like on rent calculations. Yeah. So this just shows again the um, annual gross income, the monthly gross income for the household, and the monthly tenant portion of rent, 10%. Because remember, you need to use the higher of the 30% or the 10% for the tenant portion of rent. Here you have the adjusted household income again. Monthly adjusted household income. And then 30%, so 233. So which one's higher, the 10% or the 233? So this is the number you'd be working with, right? 233, okay. But they pay utilities. So you have, here is an example where you're gonna put, you're gonna do the higher of the 10 or the 30, so I put the 233 here. I carried down the rent, the contract rent, the landlord rent, 953. And so this would be the Hopwa subsidy amount if they didn't pay this, okay? But they do have a utility allowance. So I need to subtract that 75 through the 233. And now they're gonna pay 158 and the subsidy pays 795 and this plus this equals that and that's it